right, shall we begin? I think we should. Ladies and gentlemen. Hey. Boys and girls. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the grind. This is the Startup Grind. How many of you have been to Startup Grind before? Some? Wow, a few repeat offenders. I'm huh? going to guess the rest are first time. Well, let's do that. How many of this is the first time? Okay. Welcome. It almost adds up. Almost. It's your first time. It is my first time. This is the second time we've scheduled Mark, and the first time he's made it. That's right. <laughs> So. Hey, you go where there's the money, right? Yeah. You're here. Yeah. So. Uh, That's my yeah. Very first lesson today. But well, there's money here. Yeah. Rule yeah. number one: sell to people with money. Yeah. <laughs> you may wish to write that down. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, startup grind is, uh, you know, people in startups who have some success sharing what they know, and what Mark knows is a lot. And I let me. I give my intro. I I need the book. Thank you. Okay. okay. This this book here. Have everybody who's heard of Guerrilla Marketing? Is everybody okay? Jay Con, Conrad Levinson. This guy knows well knew Jay very well. He's passed a couple of years ago. Great books. When I was starting out in business, I bought all the Guerrilla Marketing books that came out. Every single one of them. And now then I stopped. It wasn't so interesting. And then I saw this one come out. What year? Ninety. Yeah, Ninety-four. Ninety-four. Yeah. yeah. Bought this book. Uh, started applying what I learned from that at trade shows and really not even thinking about it. It's just another book I read. You know, I read hundreds of business books trying to make my business better, but I found out I was doing really well at trade shows and I thought it was my outgoing personality or fantastic products. And then what I found out since I've been in uh, Vegas now for, uh, I think going on 12 years, and, and so by you that to be arrested. time, and I was helping other people with what they were doing, I found out, so one, there was one conference I went to at the Riviera before I moved up here, um, and I was on some national board or doing something, and I, like, I couldn't walk more than three feet without somebody stopping me. It was the weirdest experience, because it was like being internet famous. Because I could walk out to the registration area and nobody knew who I was. But it was inside there for those 5,000 people I was famous. It was the uh, uh, laser printer and uh, inkjet printer uh, supplies, the business we were in. And we did recycling. And so I was like, you know, a big deal in there. And, I go, and we, so we did this booth and these other business owners who I thought were seasoned business owners had been there for 20 years or whatever, all doing ex exceptionally good things in their businesses. But we go and sit in a booth together for the association, and they like went mute. Like they never, they were afraid to talk to people. They didn't know anything about what to do in a trade show. Have you ever been to a trade show? And anybody here in Vegas? Yeah. yeah. Who here has exhibited a trade show? Okay, looks okay. like about ten percent of you. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah this is your audience. Yeah. Uh, most of the people today are doing this the whole time. Uh huh. And um, and I learned what to do here. So was what a delight when you know. 20 years later, this guy hits me up on Facebook and, you know, technology has changed. I would have never, never thought to meet the author of a book I read. And, um, and you know, the rest is history. Mark's now a friend and we meet when we can. And he's still t teaching me new things. So, As has Warren teaching me new things. Too. Anyway, so brief, uh, we got right into talking and I got to do a couple of shout outs. First of all, work in progress, everybody. Hey, good guys, they did that. Social Radius, the, the beautiful blonde out there, Molly, have, if, if you've not met her, She's say hi here. to her. If you need PR, go see her. Uh, that's their Transform PR, and Michael, Michael Turpin's company does it. Michael Turpin started this local chapter a few years ago, uh, and he wasn't able to be here all the time, so I became a co-director for this year. And so this is my second time getting to set up at front, and I like it. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Without further ado, let's get back into the interview section of the program. All right. So tell us. Tell us. You started off as what? An engineer? <laughs> as a disc jockey. As a disc jockey. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that. I started as a disc yeah, jockey best, too. Yeah, best job on earth. The only problem is that it only paid you $200 a week. And I discovered I could make three times the amount of money with my head in the transmitter and my feet on the tower climbing the tower to replace light bulbs. And so I decided I need to go to school for, to be an engineer. So I got a degree as an electrical engineer. Yeah, antenna theory. Yeah. 
That was back in the days when UHF TV was a big deal before people had rolled out cable networks everywhere. We thought we were going to do all this stuff terrestrial really with radio and TV. And then also cell towers were just coming into play. So I figured I could make a hell of a lot of money engineering antennas. Never did a one. <laughs> nah, it's pretty typical, isn't it? Who here has not used what you were trained to do? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that happens, doesn't it? Yeah. So. Um, you pivot. I did pivot. It was actually an, an unexpected pivot. HP hired me out of college, and they put me in the world of sales. This is back in the days when Hewlett Packard hired only engineers to do sales. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a different world back in those days. And of course, I had They weren't known as a computer company yet. No, they were point. test and measurement that yeah. had, they had some computers that uh, they also had at the time, and a few printers at the time. It was kind of interesting. But uh, I didn't know how to sell. I mean, they didn't teach me how to sell in school. They taught me how to design things, how to analyze things. But I figured, pff, doesn't make any difference. I know the products, I know how they work, I know what people's problems are, I can make some money. And I made every mistake in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Who resembles that remark? <laughs> yeah, right, of course, yeah. So, so that's what you did. That's, that's kind of how I got kicked off. But you know, I, the way that I did is the way that I, I saw other people sell. You know, uh, when somebody says, can you do it? I say, yeah. oh, you've done this, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no growth hacking going on. No, right no growth no. hacking. When people say, can you do it by Thursday? I'd say, sure, of right. course, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and say, in, I, I saw back in those days, you, you had a telephone, but not in your car. Um, no, then it was a typical, it. It was a typical three part no sales training. Yeah. You know, here's your desk, here's your phone, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I, had to, I went through that same program a couple exactly. of times. Exactly. Yeah. One day my boss called me in and he says, uh, Mark, uh, you know, you're smart, but your customers think you're a jerk. Actually, he said, you're an asshole. <laughs> I can use that word in this crowd. <laughs> so I had to do something different. And so I started reading business books and sales books and listen to the sales tapes, uh, back there we had cassettes, and uh, the sales masters, and I picked the brains of the guys that were making a lot of money, and they had customers refused to do business with anybody else. And I learned stuff the hard way, and I learned stuff the easy way. And since that time, I've figured out how to help people sell a lot more stuff. And I've branched out into the world of marketing with, uh, th this, was my, this was my first New York published book. What got me this is I wrote 5,000 words in the middle of a catastrophe at the house. The water pipes broke and we had a flooded basement. So I babysat that for five days and I wrote the 5,000 words that were the beginning of this book. I sold 13,000 copies of that little book. And that's how I got into it. And we all get into this business as, as accidents, right? Mm -hmm. Right, it's, it's all about finding that, that center of passion where you figure something out and you do something really cool and somebody says, well, how much do you charge to do that? And that becomes your first sales conversation, mm -hmm. right? How much do you charge? And then we tend to st stammer out the, the highest number that we can quote. And, <laughs> and that's your rate, or that's what you charge then for the next two or three years. <laughs> Until you get to be so freaking busy that you gotta, you gotta do something. And we start to raise our rates, right? That's, that really is how most Basically of us get into yeah. sales. Right? That you, that you resonate with that, don't you? <clears throat> but, but it doesn't have to be that difficult. I've learned a heck of a lot since then. A few things. A few things. And few so things. this was the first of three books that I wrote with Jay Levinson. I wrote Guerrilla Trade Show Selling. And really that book is about how do you sell in a second and a half to five seconds to 15 seconds to two minutes. Because that's what a trade show is about. Second and a half is they walk by your exhibit. How do you grab their attention in a second and a half when they're seeing 5,000 other exhibits that day? How do you grab their attention so they stop and talk to you? That's the first trick. So you have to have an extraordinary value proposition that stops people who can do business with you. That's one of the things that I love to brainstorm with people. So yeah. if you want to do that, give me so, a call. So uh, want to spin my roulette wheel is not a it's, good it's, one. You know, if you have a bowl and you're giving away a, an iPad, what you know is who, who wants an iPad? Yeah. And that's all. You don't know anything else about it. And so right. most fish bowls are the wrong flavor. You know, the way that I look at it is if one of your salespeople working for you wants what you're giving away, it's a bad giveaway. Yeah. So you want to pick something that only people that want to do business with you would find attractive. Like an assessment is, is a good an idea, or a, a tool, or uh, a how-to manual, something like that, and never, ever, ever use chance to draw your winners. 
pick your winners. Pick your winners. You may want everybody to win. You know, because that's the whole idea behind a trade show is to find new customers. So we have to get much smarter about that. It doesn't have to be very complicated. I, no. What I learned, and then I applied, I was at a recycling show. Gover I, had a, I had a contract with the state of California to sell recycled toner cartridges. And I, my business was growing. I was going to do so well and everything. We got the contract. It's two million dollars worth of stuff, and on the contract, what I learned that was back legally, when two million was a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> legally the numbers. Well, my I was doing a million dollars a year, so two million was a lot for me, and and the legal contract that came in said zero. I had the right to sell every government entity in the state of California recycled toner cartridges at a fixed price, which meant no bid. So I get a ten thousand dollar order for something I sold at thirty dollars a piece, and it would be the same as if I got an order for one. The orders for one, of course, cost us, but we, were, we ended up, we made you know, really good on that, but one of the things that happened is nobody knew about it. We were recycling. We went to a recycling show. Didn't have a budget. You know, I got in, I remember, I think I got into the show for free, and got the booth, and, and so I got one employee to go with me, and we sat there, and we didn't know what to do, so I stood in front of the booth, not behind the booth, behind the table, in front of the booth, and said to people, as they walked by, I said, do you have a laser printer in your office? And they either said yes or no. And then after that, I let them know that, you know, we had, we had an ability for them to save 50% by recycling, and here's a flyer, because they weren't going to buy anything that day. And that was pretty much all we had to do. And if Our I had, business went and double And if, from if I had then. known him back then, I would have given a different pitch. And that is, do you have a laser printer in your office? Yes, I want to buy your empty cartridges. Oh, we did that one, too, yeah. I mean, but I'm, I'm telling right? the truth, the story that actually yeah, happened. Right. And I was able to teach the person who was brand new to do the same thing. How do you have that? And, all the, and just the orders came pouring in because they found out that we had something. And, but thank you for reminding me. We did start off following that. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the, the coolest thing was watching this person. She was making $6 an hour because I was generous. That was a dollar more than minimum wage back then in the 80s. And she was working part time. She hadn't had a job for several years. It was re-entry. And her kid had just went into kindergarten and she went to work for me. And I said, in the 80s, accountants and attorneys are using laser printers. So let's go to those places in the phone book and call them and find out if they got laser printers. And so she would say, do you have a laser printer? And then she would, they say, yes. She said, what do you do with the empties? And they said, well, we throw them away. And I'd hear across the office, what? <laughs> I put her on a little incentive program. She gave me two weeks notice and I put her on an incentive program. She starts doing this and I'm going, oh please, can I pay you double? Will you please stay? <laughs> because because you, that's exactly what we did. And I train people to do that to this day that, you know, ask them the kind of question that when they tell you the answer and you n can recognize a great prospect, you can emotionally feel it and say, what? I gotta help you. I love it. Yeah. Let's get to another question. All right. All right. So, so you were corporate. You're not corporate now. How did that happen? Oh, it was really simple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. The same way I got out of it corporate. It was really simple. Yeah. It was, uh, so the 32nd version of the story is HP sent me to Amsterdam, and I worked in their marketing center in Europe. And, and, and Europe, Middle East, and Africa were my territory. It was a really cool gig. You know, they, they paid for the house. They paid for the car. They gave me a cost of living allowance. It was a really great gig. And I was there for three years. Ooh. And I ran my own show. And the way that I ran my show is I figured out how to put together a training program that taught people how to buy what I was selling. <laughs> it wasn't a pitch. It wasn't a demo. It was, let's solve your measurement problem, and I'll show you how to do it with my equipment. And of course, I'd show them how to do it in a way that the competitors could not. 80% of the people would buy after going through my two-hour class, and that's when I learned the most dangerous thing to my competitor was a customer who's educated. You might want to write that down, because that truly is the secret to competitive advantage. In fact, I still do that today for our clients, and we teach their customers how to buy what our clients are selling. And, and the easy way to, to test that is, think about your products that you're working on right now. If people knew everything about them, like you know, would they choose anything else? No. If the answer is no, you're screwed. 
<laughs> no, you're <laughs> no. If the answer is yes, you're screwed. If the answer is no, then your job is to educate people how to buy. Or, or today we say, you're not screwed. You say, you have to pivot. You have to pivot. Yeah. All right, well, that's what <laughs> screwing. Yeah, we're, we're just um, the startup so, language. Right, of course, thank you. I appreciate that one. Um, so the, the reality is that today when people call you, they've done 80% of the work. They've done the research. They've asked Siri the questions. You know, they've, yeah. Oh, you do that too, don't you? Siri, what flight's overhead? Right? Yeah. It's, it's right. It's, we ask the right questions, we get the right answers. People are getting really good at that. So part of our job is to teach people what questions to ask and then answers that you would give that would create value. So our job is to educate our potential buyers how to buy what we're selling and to generate new value along the way. Now, who here is creating a disruptive product? That's good. That's, that's really a good thing. Because, you know, disruptive product, a really good example of that, of course, is your smartphone. They didn't exist eight years ago. And now nobody's not without a smartphone. Everybody has a smartphone. So that's disruptive, which fundamentally changes how we approach the world, how it fundamentally changes how we approach everything that we do. I call my smartphone the, my flashlight. Where's my flashlight? It happens to also make phone calls, and I can watch videos on it. But fundamentally, it's my flashlight, because these eyes just don't see like they used to. But that's the whole point of disruptive technology. But in the world of disruption, your customers don't know what questions to ask. They don't know that you're creating new value they didn't have available before. So we have to show them that value in the context of what they want right now. So we take where they are, and we add a new layer on top of that. And then we add another layer on top of that. Then we add another layer on top of that until they get to the point where they won't do business with anybody else. So it really is about migrating them from their current experience to a new experience that they would like to have. So, okay. Do you do that through questions? Yeah, Question, you question. questions. How do you is a, migrate them like that? Yeah. If you're having a conversation, you do it with questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you don't have a con you don't have a conversation, you have to illustrate that. But you have to walk them through the journey. Classic mm -hmm. storytelling mm -hmm. is how you do that. Of course, okay. we can do that mm -hmm. with. But the traditional pitch, no, that doesn't work so well. It has to be story. Story is how we connect yeah. with people. Story. Yeah. And here's a storyteller who does it with PR. So yes, so, that's how we do that. And, and one of the early things I learned about sales was when you're asking questions, the other person thinks they're in charge. But you really are in charge. You're the one that's asking that's questions. That's good. That's great. Directing questions. Yeah. And, and doing that, I'm going to butt in and say, OK, so you're here. You create this great program. It worked wonderfully in Amsterdam. <laughs> How come you didn't, I guess the next thing was you took over all sales, you were vice president of marketing I, for I did kind of open some loops HP, there, didn't I? yeah. Yeah, well what happened is I came back and I was sitting in one of those interminable meetings where everybody was covering their ass. Oh, you've been there, haven't you? And I, I went to the men's room and put my head up against the cool tile and said, why the hell am I here? And the next day, I found somebody who was doing a startup. <laughs> Employee number 13, director of sales, bye-bye. Until two years later, I was in the same meeting in that startup. <laughs> we were 64 at the time, 64 people at the time, and I said, what am I doing here? Uh, right. Same place, same cool tile. <laughs> <laughs> right, Those, the, the, point, the place of epiphany that we go. And Is there one in this building, not, not for the same reason, but I just want to get cool. I'm sure. I'm sure that when we get done here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, okay. So, so that's and then I, then I found so, and then I wrote that booklet and thirteen thousand copies later I decided that I, could, I couldn't make a living me, out of this. Let me tell you about thirteen thousand copies. That most books don't sell more than about fifty copies ever. The average <laughs> is fifty. Okay. A, a, a hundred you're doing okay if it's sold a hundred copies. Uh, Five hundred you've got something going good. Well, your much, your how many books did you sell? Uh, you lots. Sell? I've sold lots of books, usually for other people. But my Twitter book sold, you know, about five thousand copies. Okay, and so the the number one Twitter book ever, Twitter Power, by my friend Joe Calm. Another person we'll have to have back because I scheduled him and didn't make it. Uh, yeah, he <laughs> he sold twenty five thousand copies of his book. It's been published in multiple languages, things like that. So just to give you some kind of perspective. Now today things work a little bit differently. The, the chance to get things out to a larger audience faster is there. But when I talked to Jay, maybe you could confirm this, 
What he said to me was the money he made off of the guerrilla marketing series was a drip, drop in the bucket compared to how much he made from being the guy that knew guerrilla marketing. Absolutely true. Did you? I, I still haven't made my money back that I invested in writing that book. There you go. <laughs> in book sales. In book sales. And everything else. Oh yeah, because it's a credibility. Because you builder. get, okay. you know, Jay's yeah. name doesn't come you know, free. The thing is, is I, uh. I get seventeen and a half cents a copy, so it's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, you don't make a lot of money doing that. That's, but but we have sold one hundred fifty thousand copies of that book. That's wow. the thirty second edition, thirty yeah. second printing. So, it did printing. reasonably well. Yeah. It did reasonably. So well. and, and there's a stat I do know for sure. There are about sixteen books in a year that go over one hundred thousand sales in the nonfiction. But to keep in mind, this yeah. is, this book is now twenty two years old. Yeah. We reference 486 processors. So, so, yeah. But the fundamentals are still solid. Yeah. They are. So, the fundamentals are still. You're going right where I want to go next with this is right. today, oh, all the technology is different. We growth hack now, we do other things different. I know the answer, but I'll ask you is any of this outmoded? No, absolutely not. And the reason why is because. What's the number one thing in sales that creates sales? Tell me, what is it? Number one. Relationship. Confidence. Needs. Maybe you can't hack a relationship. Can't hack a relationship. Confidence. A buyer. Okay. So let, 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 me, let, me, let me move this to another place and then I'll come back to it. If you could have any one competitive advantage for your product, let's say for example that, uh, that you're selling hamburgers, commodity. You can get hamburgers on every corner. If you're selling hamburgers, what would you want as your number one competitive advantage? Reputation. Reputation. Shout it out. What do you think? How it makes, How you, feel. How it makes you feel? Visibility. Visibility. People talking about it. People talking about it. Well, something unique. Okay. Gourmet ma I, mayonnaise. I have a better competitive advantage than all of those. A starving crowd. <laughs> <laughs> if I have a starving crowd, I can sell a piece of shit and I can create a multi-billion dollar organization called McDonald's. <laughs> Worst hamburger you can buy, still the most restaurants on the planet of any hamburger joint. Friends, it's about a starving crowd. It's not about the quality of your product. It's not about the innovation of your product. It's about finding the starving crowd and then offering a, a, a way to meet that need. So let me share with you a model that I innovated. When it comes to your success in the world of sales, 50% of your success, my friends, is your customer's motivation. Do they want what you're selling? Can you help them want what you're selling? It's about motivation. Because I don't care how good you are, how cheap you are, how innovative you are, if they don't want what you're selling, they're not going to buy it. 40% of our success in sales, and some of you shouted that out, a relationship. Relationship, yeah. Do they believe you? Do they trust you? Do they think that you are acting in their best interest, or are you just trying to sell them something? People buy for their own personal self-motivation, not yours, mostly. I'm afraid that's the case. <laughs> and then 10% of our success in sales is the product. Yet, yeah, where do most people put all their focus and attention when they're talking with prospective customers? Yeah, the product, right? The reality is that the heart of sales is the 90%. Well, that and really cool compression routines. Well, that does, Silicon Valley does help. Does yeah. <laughs> Got to have a really cool coding. See, see, here's the deal. Is if you can understand your customer's motivation and you can map it to their product, you win. If you can create a relationship with them, understand their motivation, and then map it to the product you own the marketplace. Is that helpful? Yeah. So you use but this. How do you create that? Ah. Or understand what their motivation is? I could tell you, but then I'd have to bill you. Not the billing. Yeah. You spent 40 years learning all this. Can you sum it up in a sentence or two? Oh, sure. I'll yeah, be glad to. On, yeah. I'll be glad to. So how do we create relationship? How do you do that? You all have significant others, or at least you have had. <laughs> how do you create relationship? Tell me. Trust. 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 Trust is what we build relationship. How do we create trust? 
Conversation, right? Conversation. What else? Being visible. Being vi okay, yeah, showing up. <laughs> Remember, That's Woody Allen said 90% of success is showing up. He didn't say that, he said 90% of sex is showing up. <laughs> Okay, so listening, right? Excellent, Offering that's value. good. Come on Offering value, yeah. yeah. Value could just also be comradeship for, you know, for a relationship. Also, my friends, it's consistency. In the world of sales, consistency is critical to building trust. In fact, it's the platform for trust. So you all know how to create relationships. That's really not that difficult. It's about conversations. It really is about conversations. So that's how we start with the relationship. You ask people questions, right? So how do we understand a person's motivation? Same way, questions, right? We ask questions. So what kind of questions should we ask? Shall we talk about that for a moment? Yeah, let's talk about it. Would that be useful? Yeah. What kind of questions? All right, so who here is going to be selling something that's going to be displacing an existing technology or an existing product? OK, got, got a few of you. Got a few of you? Okay. That's good, because the rest of you are going to be pioneers and you're going to have a lot of arrows in your back. Yeah. It's a lot easier to sell something that people already have an experience with that is better than to sell something that's fresh, that people have no idea why they should buy it, how they should budget for it, what they should pay for it. So you have to, really, it has to be incremental. My, ex my experience is that incremental always makes you more money than revolutionary, especially in the world of technology. Here's why. We've all been burnt by new tech, every one of us. So geeks are, while they like the geek factor, they're afraid. And you know, we don't like full releases. We like dot releases of products. You, know, you probably know people that are still running Windows XP. You know, and whatever the hell happened to Is Windows 9? Is that after 9? Windows 3? Whatever happened to Windows 9, huh? They just kind of glossed over that? Is that what happened? So, so one of the things that we can do is, is we have to understand a person's motivation, and there's three things we have to understand. Okay? The first one that we have to understand is what is their objective? What are they trying to accomplish? What are they trying to achieve? What, is the, what are they trying to avoid? What is it they want? What is it they don't want in relationship to what it is that you're creating? What's their objective? Got to know their objective to begin with, because that's going to drive the next question in my motivation stack. If I'm trying to pitch them something they have no motivation for, there's no an alignment between what I provide and their motivation and their objective. So we have to understand, what are you trying to accomplish? So why are we here tonight? What are you trying to accomplish? Tell me. More sales. OK, some insight on how to get more sales. All right, that's a really good objective. I want more sales. I like that objective. We can work with that. So that's the first thing we have to understand. The second thing we have to understand is their priorities. Who here has a customer that has said, I'm going to buy, but they haven't placed an order? Who has that situation? OK, we all do. If you've been in the world of sales, of course we all do. The issue is not the quality of your product. The issue is not the relationship. The issue is not their motivation. The issue now is priority. Placing the order is just not a priority. There's something that's more important. OK? So there's a few indicators of priority that we can work with. The first one is money. <laughs> it's a great indicator of priority. If they have money, and they're willing to talk with you, and they ask you how much it costs, there, there's some indication. Oh, that's reasonable. OK, there's, that's, that's good. All right. Second good indicator of priority is um, is, is, is there's, they've done something already. Now, and I'm not talking about a simple purchase. Uh, gosh, I hope we have enough time to talk about that model, because that would really be good. Sales is not sales. Marketing is not marketing. It really depends on what you're selling and how they buy. It's the psychology. Yeah, the psychology of it. So, uh, is that in the book, though? No. no. no, no. This, is, this, is actually, this is actually not in the book yet. No. This is fresh content that is yet not widely published. So money, let's do, use this one, deadline. A deadline. A deadline is something that we've promised to somebody else or to ourselves that we're going to do by this time. And if you've got a product that you can tie to a person's internal deadline, you got something. Are you talking about the subconscious here? It could be subconscious. I bet it's when it's conscious, when they realize their deadline. So one of the ways of looking at that is, can you find a blood-spurting problem? <laughs> you get it, don't you? A blood spurting problem is something that is obvious and has a built-in deadline. 
And if they don't attend to it, they're dead. It's a dead line, dead line. Yes? So it's their deadline? Their deadline. deadline you give them? Oh, no, no, their they're deadline. Their they have to feel it. That's their buy-in. Their deadline is way more powerful than your deadline. An internal <laughs> deadline is a blood spreading problem. External right. deadline is one you give well, them. Well, and everybody does have a deadline. Everybody has a deadline. Yeah. They've got an end of the month coming. They've got a quarterly report coming. They've got a meeting with the boss. They're trying to land a big client. They're trying to do something in their life. And most people selling things don't even think about that. I've got to make my quota this month. No, it's really about what they want. It's That's not right. about you. The problem is if you use an external deadline, you always give away margin. You always give away money. Tell you what, if you buy before the end of the week, by the end of the month, I'll knock off 10 points. And all you do is show them how low you'll go. <laughs> That's just stupid. Find their blood spurting problem. In fact, that's one of the first things we try to do is find out what the person's blood spurting problem is and then we sell with that. And that's going to create a lot of motivation. And a blood spurting problem rearranges priorities. All right, so these are two indicators of priorities. The third thing that we have to understand is their criteria. Criteria is what creates value for them and how they'll choose. what creates value and how they'll choose. If you are in a competitive marketplace and you're selling against something that already exists, this is what we work on. When I was doing my classes across Europe, what I did is I taught people how to choose my product. I showed them how to expand the value of what they considered when they were buying a test and measurement piece of equipment back in those days. I influence their criteria. So do you have an influence on a person's objective? Very, very little, if any. Their objective is their objective. It's personal. Now, we can influence their objective by showing them how they could do something they could never do before. And if that's important, that's a criteria for them, that's, that well, we can do that. In general, we have very little uh, power over their objective. And by the way, objective is what and why what they want to do and why they want to do it. And that's strategy. That's strategic. Priorities, do we have any impact over their priorities? Not much. Not much. You might rearrange their priority if you're offering them a deal. You know, that's that's the whole idea, right? Everybody offers deals. You know, and the deal idea there Beginner's is- Beginner's marketing. Yep. You know, a deal is an attempt to rearrange their priority. Now. We can do so. We can. There's ways to do that. And, and in the world of consulting and speaking, I have three or four of my colleagues here that are in the same business that I are. They're here stealing my content. Yeah. <laughs> but, but please, let me, let me, let me get. We came here to support you. That's yeah. what we get. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good line. Good line. We're calling it support. Right? Sure. Support. <laughs> It's support. That's yeah. Exactly. We know it's smart, man. We exactly. Exactly. <laughs> support. Support. Research. Here to, here to do research. So, um, so, so, for example, in my world, there's only three ways you get a deal from me. Let me pick the date. Because I'm going to pick a day that I'm not sold. And that day is gone anyway. So I can do a deal on a day that I pick that nobody else is booked. And so that's a good way. So it's excess inventory. You got to get rid of it, excess inventory. Second way is you buy a lot of me. Buy me, a, buy me six packs, I'll do a deal. Right? I'll knock, a, knock off a better point, you buy six days, and then I get my better deal. The third one is if you pay in advance. I'll give you a deal if you give me all the money up front. But in those cases, I get something in return, right? It's not that I'm just cutting price to get a sale. You don't want to do that. That's right. just kind of ridiculous. But you can impact a person's priority with that particular element. But it's going to benefit me as much as it's going to benefit them, maybe even more. So a uh, priority is when and where. And then criteria, we have a lot of control over this. This is the thing that we have all kinds of control over when it comes to customer acquisition. We can teach people how to buy what we're selling. And this is who and how. And this is tactical. Yet most salespeople, where do they start the conversation? With the yeah, deal. who and how. They start here. 
When the reality is if you want to sell a heck of a lot of stuff, you start up here and understand their objective, you understand their priorities, and then you talk about their criteria, and you do it in that order. And when you do that, you understand their motivation. Right. Then once you understand that, we can map that motivation to the product. See, old school sales and marketing was all about features, advantages, and benefits. Recognize Spec that? Sheets. That's old school? That's, yeah. That is old school. And the people are still teaching it. Yeah. But the problem is features and advantages and benefits is about mapping the product and attempting to map it to somebody's motivation. Right. And it's also only one click away now. Right? If they can't find that online, they're not even going to be talking to you. So features and benefits are gone. That's right. Back in my days at Hewlett Packard, we had fab sheets that we'd put together. And of course, since we wrote them, we won. Yeah. <laughs> but you look at the competitor's product against our product, and we lost. Yeah. It's highly, highly subjective. What are, you mentioned old school, what are some other examples of conventional wisdom that's still being floated today that's no longer valid? You have to sell your, you have to sell yourself first. Okay. Yeah. Don't have to do that anymore. Okay. Now the fact that you show up and that they, if they call you and you've got some sort of cred behind you, it's fine. Really what we, first thing we need to do is figure out what their objective is. Can I help you? Can you help me? In fact, our conversation needs to open with yeah. some sort of way of testing, can we meet their objective? Because if they think that you have an opportunity to solve their problems, to help them achieve what they're trying to accomplish, avoid what they don't want, then the relationship begins immediately with value versus starting a conversation with, yeah, what, you know, what sports team do you follow? You know, yeah. Nobody has time for that anymore. I, I want to I add one to that one. It's a numbers game. It's no longer a numbers game. It used to be how many doors you could knock on. Uh, you know, and I think we were talking outside a little while. In mass century, we used to say the guy with the biggest transmitter wins, biggest network, the distribution network, things like that. Well, now we know, you know, a drone can bring you anything in a couple of hours. Uh, your replicator is going to be able to make that even faster. 3D printing, you ain't seen nothing yet. 3D printing is barely getting started, and there's stuff beyond that, which is another discussion altogether. We can get anything we want, wherever we want, delivered on time and be there. And a bit, and customer satisfaction, come on, that's there. And it, so a numbers game, then, you know, used to be, can we add people? Then can we niche and really get the niche really good? Today, something's changed. In the last 25 years, billions of people have been connected together. Now, anything you want to sell, there are somebody out there desperate to get it. And if there's not, change what you're doing. What's the word? Pivot. You pivot. You pivot. Yeah. If you know, if everybody's saying no, I don't need that. Then you know. So the first thing I tell somebody to do: go look online. If you can't find an interest group and blogs and podcasts about what you're trying to sell, they're just begging to get into this. Then you're selling the wrong thing. And it may be you have an innovation and a change in it, but it isn't the features and benefits of your innovation. Is can you, can you connect with those millions of people that are online trying to find something? And today it's online trying to find something in a field in Kenya. And you know, you can sell to those people today. So that's completely changed. It's no longer a numbers game. Numbers are all in our favor now. It's a good thing. The so question just listen is, and fulfill their needs. Yeah, the question to ask is, when somebody is looking for what you're bringing to market, what question do they ask Google? Yep. Yeah. Right. When you are bringing a product to market, the question to ask yourself is, what question does a buyer ask Google? Mm. Right. One of the things that I do is I help with product launches, and it always starts with research. Always starts oh. with research. I've been doing this a long time, and I still don't know everything. And I was recently doing a program, a um, $7 billion manufacturing organization. Probably build some of the stuff you have in your house. And they're bringing to market a piece of software, and they've never marketed software ever before. So I started off by trying to figure out who's the person who can say yes. We want to do that. You don't want to sell to people who can say no. You want to sell to people who can say yes. And it took us about 30 interviews to figure out the person that we needed to get to was, had P&L responsibility. And anybody else we talked to could say no, but they could not say yes. So it was really, that was a really cool insight. I originally figured we'd be talking to the engineer about the software, the QA people about this software, but none of those people said, no, I don't start the process. I'm not the person that pushes the button that begins the purchasing process. The person that begins the purchasing process is the guy that's responsible for P&L. 
the budget. The guy that gives a damn because it's going to improve their cash flows, it's going to improve their profits, and nobody else cares. And his, because his numbers are based on that. That's right. Mm -hmm. it, is his, his it is his objective. <laughs> right. That was his objective, without a doubt. And so for me to have that insight was like blinding flash of the obvious, but still, you know. Um, and so I, we ended up doing another, another 32 interviews with people that had P&L responsibility. So 60, 62 interviews was the total uh, size of the survey that we did. And I asked everybody, when you need to purchase this type of product, how do you go figuring out what to do? And what do you think the number one answer was? Google. Google. Mm. That specific word, Google. I'd start Googling for type Whatever of they say next is, is gold. Gold, absolute gold, absolute because gold. that's where we have to be in front of people. As startups, a lot of us may not have uh, the clients yet. So who are we asking? You don't know if you're asking to find out who your clients are. Hey, these are people. Yeah. Who are you asking? Amber, these 62 people had no idea who this company was. In fact, it was a blind survey. I was interviewing them as my marketing company, and I was not revealing who the client was. Right. And if you can't find 62 people to talk to about it, again, there's no market. Pivot. There's no, there's market. no market. There is somebody out there desperately looking for. They may be saying it different. You know, the Steve Jobs thing about people don't know what they want. Henry Ford said the same thing. It's, this is not new. You can anticipate, uh, you can go where they're going to hit the puck. Uh, as Wayne Gretzky said, you know, all that's true. But if you, if you can't find somebody who's looking for it, you know, at least you got to know that there's somebody else on the ice that's going to be looking for the puck before you show up and get to, there before them. It's, you got to be in the game. You got to know what's going on. And you do that by finding out what people are going to search for. And then once you figure out what questions they ask, then <laughs> you create all kinds of content to, right. to capture that. And, and big data has just so much of this stuff that we haven't even touched yet. Of, you know, have you all heard the story of the pregnant teenager at Target? Okay, so Target, is do Target has some of the best quants around, right? And they can figure out that if somebody is buying something, they just go back three months before and figure out what those same people were buying then. And it may be something totally different. They bought a, you know, they, they bought a certain kind of Voss and to put their flowers in, and three months later they're pregnant. You know, it, what does that mean? Do, do they go together? It doesn't matter. You know, they buy a little bit larger handbag. Uh, that one makes a little bit of sense there. But they find those things. They can go through hundreds of thousands of SKUs and find out what those things are. It's really not even about asking somebody what it is you need. And so the, the, the famous Target story is that they started sending out things to expectant mothers. Coupons. And a 15-year-old got it. And the mom got it. Yeah, uh, the dad. The dad went to the manager, yelled and screamed. They apologized. They did change their policy to make sure they don't send like anything like that to a minor. And, and then the father had to apologize because he found out that what him and the daughter didn't know, that she was pregnant. She was already making decisions that they didn't even know about. And uh, so that's, that's where the future holds. There are there are people out there looking desperately for whatever it is you want to offer. And if there aren't, I got this guy trained. I need, I need you on a button. I need you on a button on my desk when I'm on, on calls and interviews. <laughs> Will you travel with me? Always <laughs> pivot. That's it. Pivot. Yeah, yeah, don't get caught up in you know, what you believe. You know, you it's, the real, well, think about it. It's not what you want. It's what they want. Yeah. And if you come up with a great idea for the best mobile app ever, remember this chart over here. You know, it's 10% product. And, and so there, some people in marketing like get carried away with this and say, well, we're going to spec out exactly we're going to buy what color the box is going to be and, and the logo and everything, and then we'll just go have it designed like that. No, that's not figuring out what people want. That's in your head. What's wrong with most marketers is that they think they know something that the customer does They doesn't. don't do the research. Yeah. I've been doing it a long time. I still do the research. You got to do the research. I still yeah, ask the questions. And in the future, it's going to be, what does this guy want? He wants a lot of attention. He wore a suit. So he's the guy I have, say, pivot. 
I made that up right now. But <laughs> it it, it sounds know. good, doesn't it? But it's, it's true, you know. I, I mean, I know John, he's a friend, and I, you know. And so, yeah, he is dressed well tonight, and he, and he likes being the center of attention. He's a great guy. If you don't know John, by the way, meet him. And the other guy in a jacket gets called on next. Ed. Ed, hey. We're kind of switching to the audience gets to ask questions now, by the way. And then we'll let you sum up. Can you give us guidelines? we can go about doing our own research for those of us who maybe have this approach may be new for us. Great. It's actually really easy. I've given you the formula, and that is it's this. Okay, gotcha. You know, uh, ask questions about their objective that are around the product or the service that you want to bring to market. Okay. It's what do you want to accomplish, what do you want to avoid? If things, you know, if you could have things any way you wanted, what would it look like? Back in the days when I was selling software, that, that startup when I was employee number 13, my, pay, my sales pitch was very simple. I would find people who ex exhibited an interest in logic synthesis. That's what we were selling. And I would ask them, if you could have anything you wanted, what would it be? And then they started to give me a list of capabilities. And I would write them down. And I'd say, what else? What else? What else? What else? What else? One of the most powerful questions you can ask when you're selling is, what else? Hmm. What else? What else? And they say, well, if you could do that, it'd be amazing. Did you just hear the sale close? Yeah. If you could do that, it would be amazing. And all I had to do was go over and say, we do this, 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 and this. I didn't have to do everything. And, and nowhere on the list was a discount for buying Never. it. Never. Yeah. Never. Never. And By that's, the way, go to any website, and on the landing page, if the first thing you see is they, they're having a sale, especially if they had another one last month, you know they're in trouble. They don't know how to market. And so how prevalent is that? Ubiquitous. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so this guy's teaching you like stuff that almost nobody knows. That is when I learned about the concept of dream-based selling. Who here believes, another old school, that it's pain-based selling? Find the customer's pains, make them feel it, make it go away, and they'll buy from you. Yep. Bullshit. What? Bullshit. No. That's right. Pain-based selling works really well if you're a low-level person mm -hmm. who gets dumped on all the time. Most people, in fact, all of us in this room, are not motivated by pain, we're motivated by dreams. We're motivated by what's possible, not what's painful. Wait a minute, quick survey. Anybody come here tonight because they were afraid of something? We're going out of business. I. <laughs> Fear of missing out. That's the, what, FOMO, right? FOMO, that's about the only one. So that's it, you, you know. That's why he's right. He, well, you're all dreaming. You all want to better We're all life. dreamers. And the better people business. that want to buy cutting edge, leading edge technology are not pain driven, they're dream driven. You are out there creating solutions to the dreamers. We're changing the world by creating dreams and making them come true. Not by solving pain. Back in those days, I figured out one of the solutions to pain was for them to throw me out of their office. <laughs> and that's when I realized the old school sales trainers were wrong. The reality is most old school sales trainers came from the world of military. It was about punishment <laughs> and avoidance. And yeah. we work way better in the world of creation and leadership. Right. And that guy you're selling to was going to, and it was a guy, that guy you're selling to is, is going to do, pull out every objection he can. He's going to try to stop you. He's going to throw up hurdle. And he's going to, and you've got to learn how to handle all the objection. You're like, if the guy doesn't want to buy, why am I bother with him? And then go back to what I said before. Billions of people are connected now. There's somebody out there who is dying to buy what you have. They got a blood spurting problem? <laughs> Let me tell you where objections come from. Until a salesperson speak, there are no objections. Right. <laughs> there are merely concerns. When I understand the concerns based on their objective, their priorities, I can sell without creating objections. I can bypass objections. They don't even have to show up. The place projections come from is from, from canned sales pitches, where we say things to which people object. And then we have to go back and fix up what we did. There's a clinical term to that. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, most sales processes are just not smart. But if we have a sale, we won't need to be smart. That's right. Yeah. Oh. No, if I, I teach marketing of the future being two things. Listen and love. Treat people like you would a friend. That's what the love part is. I and mean, you know, we're not talking about sex here. 
Um, you know, Depends so on what you're selling for. <laughs> granted. All right. Maybe what he's selling. What I'm selling. I'm selling sexy. Not, that's not okay. Sexy. Well, you know, you bring the sexy, well, so we you. got that. Did I just say that out Yeah, loud? you did. I was thinking and it it's all even evening. on. it's even on audio recording. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> So um, we are in Vegas, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just keep this one here. No, it's not like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're, people, people want to be listened to. Well, golden rule, baby. Yeah, and now golden we talk. And, and and now I've changed it a little bit. I talk about connection and stories being the two things every person wants in every encounter. Didn't everybody come here hoping to meet somebody new and learn something new and you know make better connections? No, we came for the pizza. The pizza. Yeah, that's it. There, I drive, I drive across town in 108 degree temperature for the pizza. Um, <laughs> no, we're here for the connection, we're here for the people. And that creates relationship and that's stories. If, if Mark's done a good job, you're gonna tell a story about it. You're gonna share it with somebody. Please do, I'll write more. Yeah, and, and hopefully you made a connection. And if you need help with this in your business, see Mark. Yeah. And if he says no, see me. <laughs> I'm a little bit more open. I've got next Thursday open. <laughs> solid for a month, you give a, so. a discount though? Uh, no discounts. Uh, there's one cool. place where, there, I say there's one place to use a discount. And that's when you're trying to give somebody a deadline. You can set a deadline. You can say, listen, this is the, I've got a friend that does this. He sells very high end things. And he'll get on the phone with you one time. And ask you if you're a decision maker and you like to do stuff fast. He'll, using dreams. At the end of the conversation, he says, you're a person that takes action. I only want to work with people that take action. You either, you can tell me yes now, and you're going to get a discount, and, or you, you can come back at the other price. The only reason he has the other price is so that the people can say, well, I may get around to a time, and maybe I can get him down. I recently talked to him after 10 years of selling the same thing, or sending by the side of his pool in his large house up in the hills of Henderson. And I go like, uh, I gotta, I gotta ask you something. I was with you when you started that. Uh, how often does somebody come back and they just have some kind of an exception or a story? And, says, and he got, you know, he's just sitting there chilling and, and he got, never. I never will do that. And he's told me other stories about people who like call back at the last minute or decide they don't want it for a reason or whatever like that. And he's just learned. And I call it being a shark, you know. He's eating the fish and then moving on. And, I got, and as I got to know this better, well, that makes sense. He's got integrity. He gives somebody a discount. They have to make a decision right then and there, and that's the way to do it. Two years later, I asked him, he says, no, nah, I don't bother to do that anymore. Now I'm doing well enough that people want me and they, they don't want that. He just posted on Facebook yesterday and said, uh, for all those people who have me on your vision board, take my picture down. I don't want that kind of a customer. So, yeah. Yes, he is a little cocky. He's also extremely, extremely rich and helps people make a whole lot of money doing that. All right. Yeah, and you can't get, you, I won't tell you who he is. I'll send you to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Warren. Yeah. Mark feels like he owes me. He I may did. take uh, one customer. It may be. Yeah. <laughs> it may be. It could be. You're what questions enough. do you have? What questions? Yes, sir. When you're building a product until you have to build it for the game and then you can go to aspirational marketing, show them the life could be once they purchase a product. Yeah, you sure can. I mean, but the thing is, my recommendation in creating a product is always advancing a person's experience. And so um, earlier this year at Com at uh, Stories. No, C CES. 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 Yeah, CES. It was yeah. CES. Um, there was a, an event that was called the Future of Entrepreneurship. Anybody happen to walk into that event? I did. And I had no idea what to experience, but hey, future of entrepreneurship, I'm an entrepreneur, let's figure out what's out there. And in walks Steve Case, founder of AOL, Eric Butterworth, founder of Flickr, and Matt Woodman, founder of GoPro. I said, this is gonna be good. Mm -hmm. We had a boomer, Steve Case, we had an ex-gen, Eric Butterworth, and we had a millennial with Matt, uh, wouldn't it? And so Steve Case talked about how we have to have infrastructure and we have to have policy and he talked about the, 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 the building blocks that we have to build to be successful in a world of entrepreneurship. And then um, Eric talked about how we need a team. We need to put together the team of people that could help us get there. 
And what Matt talked about, yeah, what Matt talked about, he says, find centers of passion and make the experience frictionless. Boom. Boom. That's I know it. When, we're, when you're saying something good, her eyes light up. <laughs> and that's really what you want to see. You want to, have a, you want to have a prospect that's just like, yeah, that's, that's what I need. Centers of passion and make it frictionless. What, uh, uh, what Matt says is we help people share extraordinary experiences with their friends. And we sell it through centers of passion. Surf shops, bike shops, motorcycle shops. Then we make it frictionless. And if you think about it, think of, shout out a rapidly growing company name that you, we all know, shout it out. Uber. Uber. Uber makes finding a ride frictionless. Shout another name. Netflix. Netflix makes watching video frictionless. Shout another name. Good. <laughs> Airbnb. Airbnb makes finding a room frictionless. Shout another word. Online banking makes banking frictionless, no lines. What else? Shout it out. Doesn't anybody shop around here? Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook. Facebook makes connecting with friends frictionless, right? Amazon. So Amazon makes buying things frictionless, one-click shopping. So Evernote makes keeping yeah. organizing data frictionless, yep. right? Any platform. So if you think about who's growing fast, it's about frictionless experiences of what you want. How can you make that work in your business? Uber, largest taxi company on the planet, don't own a car. Airbnb, largest housing company on the planet, don't own a hotel room. Google, right. largest server manufacturer on the planet, doesn't sell servers. This bigger is than hot HP, stuff, guys. Bigger than IBM. One out of 100 pundits will get this. What do you see? What do you see in the in the news sources? You know, they went out to kill taxi companies and GM. That's not what Uber did. They made getting a ride frictionless. That's it. It's about frictionless. Um, they made it, they made Facebook it easy. is currently the largest media company on the planet, and they don't create media. YouTube, as well. YouTube right? The biggest broadcaster on the planet. Yeah, YouTube's uh, producing content now. Is there a company that makes uh, customer service frictionless that you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, what's the question? That's customer a, service? That's a, that's, 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 a, that's a really good question. That's, a, that's there, one to be working on. There's an opportunity. Like there, there, are some, there are some companies that are doing some amazing things there, but it's got a long way to go. There's certainly interesting opportunities. I, I yeah. think that you can probably do some interesting things there. You know, like, right. for example, the word health, in the world of healthcare, on a scale of one to 10, customer service is like a minus three. Mm -hmm. No, there's some interesting opportunities there, but there's a lot of challenges. Healthcare in general, just going to the doctors. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, healthcare, healthcare across the board. Right. Healthcare and across it, the board is horribly broken. Right, and it's, yeah. it is, it's all based on a system that's propped up by things that have nothing to do with providing a good service. Yeah, that's right. And that's why it's ripe for disruption. So, my favorite example when I'm teaching is dry cleaners. If I go to my dry cleaner and I drop something off, say I'm coming out to speak at Startup Grind and I want to wear my lucky jacket. And so I take it in to have it dry clean and they say, it's Monday, we'll have it ready for you. We'll have it ready for you Wednesday at five o'clock. I'm going, that's just fine. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop by and pick it up on my way to this event. Um, and what, it, what happens is if they have a problem, if I have to do something else, or if I'm late, and usually when I tell the story I'm talking about, I gotta catch a flight and go someplace. But for whatever reason, I want them to move heaven and earth to get me that jacket. I did, did you get it, we're gonna express it to you, you'll have it tomorrow night, it'll be in the hotel waiting for you. Yeah, likely. Yeah. <laughs> but what is this, Nordstrom cleaners? <laughs> well, no. Hang on, you wanna to have whatever it is. Now, when I get back and I spill something on the jacket and I would like to have it clean, when do I want it? I don't really care. I'm going to need it next month, maybe. I'll stop by in a couple of weeks. The last thing I want to do is hear from you. Right. I don't want to know that you have a discount. Objective I'd, priorities. Right. When we get customer service, I'm answering your question. When we get customer service down to using technology, big data, overcoming what he thinks is, is impossible, which we, you know, a dry clear could do that, we figure out what it would take to get somebody. There are companies now that you, if you decide you're gonna be like, say you're a speaker and you go around speaking, you always want, uh, my friend Jay Bear does this. This, is, this would be a very subdued jacket for Jay Bear. 
okay? He's always wearing fancy clothes. He has a tailor come to his house and get the right kind of clothes for him. And then he uses a service that is, takes a bunch of his clothes and they're available to be shipped wherever he's going. And that company, if he shows up someplace and the suit's not right, they better be taken care of him. Not, oh, we're busy, we'll get to you next week. Because he's a guy that makes a whole lot of money and wants this service and he's paying for it. I think it's $100 every time he uses the service. And they figured out a way to do that to make it frictionless for him. And what, he, what Jay told me last time he was in Vegas, we had dinner and he says, what I, want to, what I want to do is when I go home, I do not want to leave the house. I don't want to drive my car. I don't want to go out to get something. I don't want to go to a movie because I travel 80% of the time. And so I want everything taken care, t taken care of. Well, it used to be, we talk about, if you're a speaker and you're on the road, you've got to make certain adjustments to your lifestyle and get these things taken care of. Can I get an amen over here? Is that amen. true? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of logistics. But if all you had to do was, was answer the door when the chauffeur picks you up, be taken to the airport, get on the plane without any security, show up wherever you do, wouldn't your job be a whole lot easier? You know, that's the model of professional sports. I mean, like tonight, you know, you got the NBA Finals. What, how do professional sports set up athletes? The athletes do two things. They play the game and they practice. Everything else is taken care of. Right. Yeah. And there you go. Life? And that's frictionless customer service. So we're a long way from having that anywhere. Uh, we're still dealing with omnichannel problem. Does anybody know what omnichannel is? Say again. Omnichannel. I was on a panel, this is two years ago. They asked me to go to some place, it's at the Venetian, it's a big deal. They said, we'd like you to be on the, uh, we'd like, I was the MC, so I showed up and stood in front of a whole bunch of Fortune 500 people talking about travel incentives and things like that. It was a lot of fun. And they said, well, you know, we have one panel open, would you like to be on us on Omni Channel? And I'm going like, Omni Channel. Channels mean retail versus online, okay? What do you mean omnichannel? Well, there's a big movement in corporate America to move the two things together. So you can buy something on Amazon and take it to Walmart and return it, if they're partners, obviously. Or you know, you buy something you buy something online from Apple and you can take it to an Apple store. That does work. That one works. When I started selling stuff online in the 90s, that's how we did it. We wouldn't ever consider that somebody walking in the front door would get something different because we were one one location. And they told me this, I go like, are you kidding me? I started looking into it. And sure enough, I was able to sit on the panel. I did a really, had a really good time talking about Omnichannel. And I found out there are agencies, there are people you can hire to come in to make it so that your agents at the gate of your airline can do things with somebody else's online. And then there's the, so I just got, uh, I got a really screwed up flight. An American gave, gave my wife and I two hand printed passes to be able to get uh, $300 a piece. They just expired the other day, so I'm really mad at them. Because my wife doesn't fly, I got to use mine. I had to take it to the airport and buy the ticket at the gate. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let me order it online or do anything. Then they screwed up on our way home from that, and we got two more that were online. I got to use my wife's, I just punched in the number, everything was fine, it was a hassle compared to a lot of things. But hey, I got that, you know, so I got the $600 and I got 300 and there is a piece of paper that looks like an old fashioned punch card that's got my, my wife's $300 on it. And last week, I mean last month, I figured out that I couldn't spend it. I, everything I tried, there's nothing I could do. I put it off forever because I didn't want to drive the airport. Go to the airport on a Wednesday afternoon because you need to fly in two weeks? What, this is crazy, I was there an hour and a half, waiting in line, all, all the hassle with it, and all of this stuff has become frictionless. When I was a kid, you didn't ever go to the airport without a ticket. Today, who wants to do that? When was the last time you printed out a ticket? Yeah, you know, there are still airlines that don't give you a barcode on the phone, I don't get that. You have to like, print out a boarding pass in this day and age. So there's so much customer service less to do. We had a question over here. Yeah. Mark, with all your research on how you find clients, what are some other insights that you can share with us? I'll be delighted to do that. Fundamentally, three things. You like my three things rule, right? Three no, things, three things. And holy, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, it really does work. <laughs> <laughs> it's been around for a long time. 
<laughs> so the first thing is... That's something to write down, guys. People you already If you're know. writing somebody an email, three points. Three things. Three points and support one point. So the, Not uh, four. The first, the first one is make a list of everybody you know. Friends, family, fools. Mm -hmm. and, and work with them first. Everybody you know. Who do you know who would find that an interesting situation? So you start off with people that you already have a relationship with. That's the, that's the starting point. Then ask them the questions to understand their motivation. Right? And that's going to give you a lot of indication about what's going on. So the objective, priorities, criteria. You go through those questions. And that's going to give you some insights. It's not going to give you everything you need, but it's a great place to start the conversation. When I was working with this particular company for the software gig, I started off with their employees that did the function of the people I wanted to sell to. So I started off with internal people relationships that were easy for me to connect with so I could tune and test my questions. I like that. Right. Does that make and sense? How, oh, yeah. And uh, how much of the code do you write before you do this? Uh, none of it. <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. Not, not, and not one, not, one no, lick of code. No, not, no, no. You don't need a working I, prototype. I don't, I don't write any book without knowing who's going to buy it. No first. MVP. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, because I don't know what the viability is yet until yeah. I get three research. Right. So second. And you won't need to pivot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I used to write books without knowing who'd buy it. Now I don't write a book until I know exactly who's going to buy it. Well, Walt well, Disney so. never drew Mike Mickey Mouse. Yeah. A boober drew it before. He just kept pitching the story, but that's the old model when there wasn't a lot of right. cartoons, there wasn't a lot of entertainment. Right. That back in those days, he had very little competition. That worked in the absence of competition. Yeah. So, so we have to take a look at the frame in which that was presented. Right. So is that a relevant frame today? No. Well, he's still selling the dream. Right. He's still he selling the dream. I, right. And thank you for that. You're absolutely yeah. right. And you're still, and the, the idea is he may have been doing research because he lived his life. So some of this does happen, you know, naturally. It's so just a question of what we're talking about speeds that up. Let me give the other two points and then, I'll, then we'll, we'll ask the other questions. So then the second thing that you want to do is target who you want to do business with. Make a list of people that you want to do business with. Who is your dream list? And then you create, it's going to be a fairly short list. Who do you want to serve? Who do you want to sell to? Specifically, by name, by company. And then you put together a strategy called contact marketing, where you create a campaign specifically for that person. And so you might replicate the campaign 15, 20, 30 times with them in mind. You do the research and you put together a, a, a conversation starter with them. The very best book on that is Stu Hynek's how to get a meeting with anyone. How to get a meeting with anyone. Just put that in Amazon, buy the book, 13 bucks. Fantastic. How to, buy, how to get a meeting with anybody. It's contact marketing, that's what that is. And that is where we create a campaign to go after specific people. Then the third thing is you create an online campaign with those, that information that you learned about what question do people ask Google. And you create videos. Ed, uh, uh, Darren. Darren, thank you. Not at Darren is really, yeah. really good at this. He has a thousand videos on YouTube. He is the he wow. owns what's your categories that you own these days? Speaking and storytelling. Speaking and storytelling. You Google that and he shows up top of the list. Mm -hmm. So he has really, really nailed this one tight. Where where do you show up? And it's all it's not sales, it's all information. Yeah. Every bit of it. Every, everything he does is teaches people how to buy Darren. So those are the three things, sure. right? Friends, family, fools. Who do you really want to do business with? With contact Friends, marketing. Family, fool. Contact marketing, the three Fs. And then what question do people ask okay. Google? Step in front of that. We got to be we gotta wrap aiming to wrap it up. Right. But you had a question? More of a comment. I was just going to say that a lot of times customer discovery can be a really complicated venture. And a lot of times it's unsuccessful in my experience. Yeah. Uh, so in my most recent startup, I actually just started with the group that I wanted to serve. Then I started with, next I did the contact marketing. I didn't have any product. Just how can I get in front of these people? Start questions, yeah. And then came up with a product 
So now once I figured out how to get in front of these people effectively and cost effectively, then I started brainstorming off, okay, where can I sell these people? That's it. That's the magic today. That's good. That's, That's good. the one that has the high okay. probability of winning. And then I already have my sales funnel built before I even am worrying about the product. Right, right. And by the way, this applies if you're trying to get funding, you would use the same process. What do people with money want from you? You know, what, what is it, what is you're it trying investors? to get a regulatory issue solved. You would do the same process. What is, what is it that investors want? <laughs> to prove that you have people who will buy, to prove that you have a, a, a starving crowd. Right. That's what investors want to see. Do you have a starving crowd? That's it. That's all they care about. You're going to be our last question. The answer to that is yes, when you're building an online profile to, to do online advertising. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is we can target ads to male, female, age groups, all those kind of things. And we're going to go for people that have a high propensity. But you get all of that based on Friends, Fools, and Target Market. I'll, I'll add on one, one little comment. I, the, the guys are doing buying personas and at the head of all this, of writing books on it, friends of mine. And I asked them because I, I've been, I was starting to wonder, are demographics dead? Do we say that? I hate using that kind of a phrase. Blogging is dead. No, you know, but anyway, I, so I went to him and I said, what, what do you say when somebody says demographics is dead? He says, demographics is a factor. It's a minor factor. If you're going to sell, you know, uh, women's shoes, you're not going to, you're not going to target old men, right. except for John. Uh, but, um, because the ladies like shoes and John buys them for them, right? Um, Thank you for putting it yeah. that way. Yeah, <laughs> that guy over there, he's the one that's wearing them. But no, no you're, most of your market's going to be d d d some demographics. People with kids are going to have to buy stuff for their kids, you know, in those sizes. But for the most part, like in business kind of stuff, it's just one thing. And I flash back to when I studied this and all the computerized data that we could get that was two years old and had been given to us by an ad agency or a college could mess with it and it came out quarterly and it was, you know, books with computer printouts, you know. It had to be demographics. We learned what psychographics was, but we didn't have any of the data. We couldn't get it. Today we've got that. You can tap into all sorts of things. Even in a even in a Google AdWords campaign, so so he's right and then some. So pitch something. Pitch Tell something. us it's the end. This is really simple. You every know? every week, I write about 250 to 500 words on customer acquisition. So give me your business card. I'll put you on the list. Check out my blog. I write every week. If you want to link with me on LinkedIn, MarksOnLinkedIn.com is the frictionless way to get there. Oh, yeah. Marks on LinkedIn.com. Marks, our articles by Mark.com will take you to my blog. And I'll be delighted to uh, stay in contact with you. Questions, you know, we can, always, we can always have a conversation. Conversations are always free. Right. I only charge for deliverables. It's just that simple. So, mm -hmm. and if you, if you can't find him or there's another Mark Smith that gets in the way, well, find me. I'm easy to find. So. Right here. So, or if you, if you write it down wrong, don't worry about it. I'm there. <laughs> you're you're going to hear from me again. Uh, do you like this kind of stuff? Yes. 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 Okay, great. If you have suggestions for who else you'd like to hear from, uh, or you know, what, you'd like, what topic you'd like, let me know. That's me over there, Warren Whitlock, or you know, try to avoid getting an email or seeing me online. I'm the, I'm the guy doing this most of the time. Uh, on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And there you go. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you in two weeks.